So I grew up with Tar Heel roots and Tar Heel spirituality, if I can say it that way. My grandparents um, were Pentecostal preachers in the Wilmington, Wallace, Burgall area out there in the country area on the coast. And uh, they were country preachers. And then when you shake our family tree, preachers fought out. So there's Methodist preachers in our family. There's United Brethren. So our family tree produces preachers. Some trees produce presidents or lawyers or doctors or whatever. And thank God for whatever your tree produces. If it produces nuts, chop it down and plant a new one. So you can have fruit that works. Come on. And so um, my grandparents were the first Pentecostal preachers in our family. I'm a happy, spirit-filled Pentecostal preacher. I love my whole Pentecostal roots. I love all the vibrations, gyrations, tongues, and everything. When you were raised Pentecostal, you saw God do some big things. Come you on. saw the devil do some stuff. You saw flesh do some stuff. And you saw some stuff. You don't know who did it, but you saw it. And that's called being raised Pentecostal. And anybody else understand that? Uh, uh, all right. So, uh, what does that mean? You don't know what, who was the author of it, but you saw it. And you're sitting there, you're still wondering about it 25 years later, uh, but you saw things that you can't really explain. They just saw stuff. And uh, so I was born in the city of Tulsa in an open heaven. So I grew up in Tulsa with uh, my parents going to Oral Roberts University the first year that it opened. I was born the next year. And so that's why my name is Roberts, because all and Evan, my parents, uh, got together, named me Kenneth after my father, Roberts after Brother Roberts, and then Laird in my surname. And so I grew up in my diaper running through Oral's house and all that kind of stuff. So I thought the whole world lived in the open heaven until I started leaving Tulsa and realized oh, we had something special. Yeah. And, um, and so what we took for granted, uh, I was there as the revival began, what we call the Word of Faith. Because Tulsa was a governmental city of the move of God. Uh, certain cities, geographically in history, were governmental. They were where God launched the government of his purpose at that time. Chicago would have been one. Dallas would have been one. L.A. would have been one. Tulsa was one in our lifetime. And so he's looking for a new governmental seat again today. Come on. He may have more than one, but I know he's looking for one. And uh, to be honest, I've been to 127 countries in the world so far in my life. Uh, it's called Why My Friends Are Building Churches. I was traveling the world, casting out demons in odd <laughs> places. I'll say it that way. Come on, and, brother. Uh, loved it. And so every place I go, they always say, uh, God said the revival is going to start here. Every city, every state, every nation has a prophecy. Yeah. And I'm going to make you very sad in it. But most of them don't come to pass. Uh, I've been in some of those cities so many times. I've been told their prophecy where I know better than them now. Uh, I, I talked to the guy who gave it the first time around. And now they're the grandchildren still talking about it and it hasn't come to pass. So it's very rare, historically speaking, for the prophetic words over cities and over a certain geographical to come to pass. Because most people like the announcement, not the work to make it come to pass. Wow. Wow. And so we're going to have to get out of the dove ministry, the eagle ministry, the lion ministry, and get out of the ox, which is a work ministry. Yes. Come on, so, work it, uh, brother! The, the, the symbols of revival are changing. So the dove has left the building, the eagle has gone home, the lions are sleeping, and the ox has come. Come on. And uh, we'll talk about, I noticed no one clapped on that because all your holy animals I just kicked out. <laughs> so um, I picked one that none of you really like, like an ox. Ah, yeah, it's in the Bible. It's a part of Ezekiel's vision. It's a part of the symbol of the Lord. But most people don't talk about an ox because they love the lion, they love the eagle, and they love the dove, and all these things. And so, and I, I really appreciate all of this. But Proverbs 14, 4 says that by the strength of the ox, much increase comes about. Increase. We're talking stadiums, we're talking bigger churches and outbreaks. So the anointing that we've had only has gotten us what we've got. So if we're Come going on. to go to yeah. these other levels, you have to That's have a Jerry different Joyce type said. of structured anointing. And a symbol that would represent that is that of an ox. And so uh, I know you can go to a Christian bookstore and ask them, give an ox picture, and they'll go, no, what's that? If you ask them for a dove picture, or a wind picture, or a lion statue, they'll have 50 of those. But nobody has an ox picture, so maybe some of you Holy Ghost painters can do some ox pictures now. And uh, it might be helpful to get people into a mindset that this is a work anointing, not just a whoa. I see that it's going to get your button gear and go plow and go build and go do those things too, amen? When I was 12 and a half years old, I was watching their Vernon Shirley on television. If you know who that is, that dates you really good, okay? 
Because okay. most of you don't know who they are, but those were the days where Happy Days, the Vernon Shirley, Three's Company, and Taxi all was coming the first Three's time Company. on television. <laughs> so we were watching them. And so I was watching the Vernon Shirley, which at that time was one of my favorite shows at 12 years old. And Jesus walked through the front door of my house while I was watching the Vernon Shirley. I wasn't praying, I wasn't fasting, I was a little boy that was going to school and loved God and was minding my own business watching Laverne and Shirley do one of their things and laugh and have a good time and I saw a foot come through the door and then the leg and the whole body come right through the door and I was sitting over here on the sofa and he took a right turn and walked about three steps and then the room seemed to go back three to five hundred yards where you could hear Laverne and Shirley in the background like the TV in the background. And he said to me, study the lives of my generals. Wow. Come know on. why they succeeded and why they failed. Wow. For there will come a generation who will need to know what I will teach you. You will be faithful to pursue that which I've told you today. And by this you will be able to save gifts, unwrap gifts, and bring clarity to them that have gifts in the time of your ministry and wow. your life. And, wow. da, da, da. and so that language to me was go read and study about preachers. And my head goes... I don't like that. I don't want to go read books. I knew what it meant to study because my mother has earned two masters and a doctorate. So wow. me and my sister and my mom would all be doing homework at nighttime because we were all going to school. So we would go to libraries and not theaters because mom had to do her study. And so we would go. So I knew what it meant to study and work the libraries and those things. And I thought, I don't want to read books about preachers because most of them that I knew so at that Pastor time Tommy. were overweight and they spit when they preached and they were <laughs> not very exciting. So, and most of them preached hellfire and brimstone and got you saved by fear and not by the love and the faith of God. So the salvation worked mainly minimum or you backslide later. Wow. Uh, so I grew up knowing how to preach hellfire and brimstone, which means I can burn you while you're sitting here and scare you to the altar because you might leave tonight and go into a crisis eternity and get hit by a car on your way home and die and go to hell. That's the way they gave altar calls in those days. They didn't know anything about what God actually said in his word that by the goodness of God that brings men to repentance, we kind of thought by the threat of hell we'd get you saved. And that's why salvation was just fire insurance policy for most generations and not a love walk, a relationship that we're enjoying today. Amen. Are you all here? Yes. Come on, and we're so here. so I began reading books and then I discovered that some of the folks I was reading about, their kids were alive and then I began to realize their secretary was alive and there were folks who knew them so I began to hunt them down and collect all their stuff and all their stories and all that kind of stuff. So why most of my friends today play golf, I hunt old people that have treasures from <laughs> ancient history times and I collect them so we don't lose them because when their kids get them, they usually throw it in the trash because they know what they are. And so I begin to do that. So now they tell me I've read about 14,000 books so far in my life. So wow. I wear glasses wow. because my eyes are tired. And so I've read <laughs> big books that are this big with no pictures. Wow. That's why all my books have pictures, because I determined when I start writing, we're going to put pictures in my book, because it's not fair to write three epistles under one cover and not one photograph for you to take a moment and relax and see who you're talking about. And, so, and then I also write my books in simple terms, because I had to read books with a dictionary, because there was no iPhones Man. in those days, and I had to look up words, because the words were this big, and I couldn't even say them to see what the professor was trying to say, so I determined to write to a high schooler. That means anybody of any age can get it. Right. That's why my book sells and there's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not, don't ever write for a critic or a theologian. Write for the guy that worked eight hours and loves God and want to take Come ten on. minutes of their afternoon to read the Bible and a chapter of your book or a page and give them something they can give without stressing themselves out like, what did that word mean? Right. Good. And you'll move the masses that way. That's good. Martin Luther said, if you want to change the world, put pen and paper together and you will change the world. Wow. And it's still that way too, even though there's periscopers, but the <laughs> printing page still works around the world. And so I begin my journey. So tonight I'm going to start with you. I'm here with you for three days and I'm going to be aware of time maybe once or twice and probably ignore it. <laughs> because I have 2,000 years of history to tell you in three days, and that's called a miracle. Right. And so we're going to start in Acts, the last chapter. Are you ready? Yeah. Now I'm going to talk like I'll be driving California, fast and everywhere. So you have to follow, or you just have to get the CD or the DVD later, all right? The book of Acts is the incomplete story of the early church. It is not the complete story of the early church because we don't know what happened to Matthew or Mark or John. There is no biblical record of their life after certain things are in it. 
And so the book of Acts mainly is about two people, Peter and Paul, and even their story is incomplete. And so every book in the Bible has a beginning, a message, and a proper conclusion. The book of Acts is the only book that is still being written today. The book of Acts is being written today, but we don't call it Acts 1 billion chapter. What we call it after Acts 28 ends, we call it church history. But it's the same thing. It's the story of God finding a cooperative passion of people or a person who will work with him in a time and a culture to get his will done for that people and to lay a foundation for a future generation coming. And the story of what we call church history is what they did, what they had to overcome, where they failed, why they failed, so you don't make the same mistakes. Because most people keep repeating the same thing because they're too stupid to sit down and read the story in the Bible and history and go, what was right and what was wrong? The Bible tells you everything about a person. King David was a national hero. He destroyed Goliath and chopped his head off. Became the king and brought back the ark. He was a great worshiper, but he also, in one chapter, was a liar, a murderer, and an adulterer. All in one chapter. No one told me that in Sunday school. They just told me he was a worshiper and he killed Goliath. When I read my Bible through the first time, I was in shock at how many crazy people were in the Bible that no one told me the rest of the story. When I read about Noah and the ark, he built the ark and his family got in all the animals, the creepy ones and everything got in. And they came him out and he read it, came out with the rainbow. Next chapter, he grows a vineyard, gets drunk and gets naked. And there's trouble. Noah was one of our first streakers in the Bible that we talk about. I could not believe that Noah, the great salvation guy of the Old Testament, that built the ark, was naked and drunk in the next chapter you think you've got to go to a boat and you say the animals you keep your underwear on but he didn't do it so the bible tells you the rest of the story saint peter in the new testament was the man that was the loud mouth of the twelve and said what the rest of them were thinking he said i'll never leave you and i'll stand beside you and he denied the lord three times if he was a semblance of God man, he'd still be in restoration by the time Pentecost came by. And he'd have missed the opportunity to be the preacher of the New Testament. Oh, oh yeah! That was the story. You can process it over dinner. Damn! It's not biblical. It's for the emotion of cash. Not the emotion of God's restorational process. And so, Peter became the mouthpiece. And begin to come. And Paul comes along in the beginning of his story, as you know, consenting to the first martyr of the church. And most of the believers at that time knew Paul's name, which was Saul. And he, they were scared of him. And finally they said, we got to allow this guy in and begin to talk and found him to be one of the great church planners of the New Testament. And he writes here, Dr. Luke does, a medical doctor writes two books of the Bible. Don't tell me God don't like doctors. He wrote two books of the Bible and they're the most detailed because that's a part of a doctor's nature. The Gospel of Luke is probably the most detailed Gospel record of Jesus. And the book of Acts was written by Dr. Luke. And he wrote by inspiration that which was needful, but that which was not complete. And the book of Acts ends like this. Acts 28 and verse 30 and 31 says this. Everybody with me? Am I talking too fast? All right. It's good. It says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. And received everybody that knocked on his door. When they came in, he didn't say he wanted a cup of tea. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness or confidence. And no man intimidating or forbidding him. And the book of Acts just goes, boop. Yep. You don't even say the end or it's over. It just, boop. It just stops. Right. And that's why we know that it's still being written today. We don't even know according to the biblical record what happened to Paul and Peter, but we know according to what we call church tradition that the 12 apostles, all of them died a martyr's death but one. The youngest one lived a natural death. His name was St. John. He was on an island called Patmos, a work island, a hard work island. Well, while he was out there being punished for his faith in Christ and working like a young man when he was an older man, God gave him the book of Revelation that we're still trying to figure out what he said today. When I get to heaven, I thought, could you not have wrote some explanation with your visionary activity? Because it has caused a whole group of people today to live their life trying to figure out revelations. And here's how you should figure it out. Stay blessed until he comes, work until he comes, and know he's coming. And quit spending your whole life worried about the four blood moons. Get over it. And go do the gospel. Amen.
And so if you just know the high points and don't be intrigued over all the mystery, know that until he comes, we're supposed to be bold working, doing the harvest and having a good time doing it. But Brother Robert said Antichrist might be alive in Europe, but I'm alive in North Carolina and South Carolina. That means something too. Come on. Until I'm gone, he can't do all he's going to do because greater is he that's in me than he that's in Europe. And so we have to live on a occupying tone of the last days and not just waiting for the rapture to come. I grew up in the church where everything was on the other side. When we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be, they would sing. And they'd sing Judah Land and all those songs. And one day we were singing, I Judah fly land. away, oh glory. And we'd clap and that was our fast song in the church. And then I'd, when I died, I thought, I'm too young to sing this. I'm not going to die. So I quit singing I Fly Away and won't even permit it to in my <laughs> church. Because I don't plan to die. I plan to live as long as I can and ask for a couple of days extra when it's supposed to die. And so I yeah. realized that most of us were escapers. We wanted to get off the planet because we couldn't pay our bills. We couldn't years. fix our kids. We didn't like our husband no more. And so we had all these troubles and the only way out was rapture time and get us off the planet. Preach and that's why it. darkness built strongholds. <laughs> And that's why darkness became trends, and trends became culture, and culture now is dominating us in an evil way, and we are living in a product of escapism. Right. Jesus said we are to occupy until he comes. Right. And Tell so me, brother. Read the story of how people occupied in their generation. Hopefully you'll be inspired to be occupiers today. St. John got off the island when a new governor came into power. He wanted to gain favor with the new citizen that he was now, the, the, the city that he was now over. And so he let most of the people in Patmos go free. And John was one of the ones that went free. Can you imagine? You walk into an early church and there lives in your church or sitting in your church. The last apostle of the Lamb sitting on the front row. And you're supposed to get up and preach about Jesus. And here's a little glass guy that actually... Walk with him and talk with him. Can you imagine about intimidation that service would be? If I was the pastor where St. John was, I'd have put him on a chair, put him on the stage and said, glow. Glow. Just glow or do what you want. Can we just stare at you for a while? You're the last living apostle of the Lamb. And so wow. St. John, when he died either in his late 90s or the year 100, the history doesn't quite tell us for sure, but in the later years of his life, he was in his 90s when he died. And the story is that his followers that he had trained wrote down his last words. Now this is the last words of the last apostle of the Lamb. And you would think of all the things that man could have said. He could have said, have more visions. That would have been wonderful. There's greater glory and greater anointing. And that would have been true. But the thing that he said was very intriguing. Love one another. And he dies. So the last word of the last apostle that walked with Christ wasn't, whoa, here's the glory. He goes, would you please like each other? <laughs> and what does that mean? That meant already in the early church, they were fussing Christians with one another. And that has been a problem throughout church history. It's when you don't do the gospel, you end up beating each other up. Come on. And so may we remember the words on, of St. John when he said, like each other, love each other, and quit killing them. And start working together for the cause of Christ. Come on, brother. For three to four hundred years, or maybe a little bit more than that, the gospel message stayed true to the words of Christ and the words of the apostle. And mainly it was summed up like this in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you just believe, you'll have eternal life and live forever with him. And heaven was preached more than hell. Forgiveness more than judgment. And there were three things that confirmed the words of God's men and women that preached the gospel. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Come on. But when it came to the time when the church world changed and religious demons took charge of the church, they replaced all of that with this. God became a God that's going to get you, not bless you. He became an angry God, not a loving God. All of a sudden, wrath overtook forgiveness. Your sickness is now was the curse of your sins that were due to you because you were a bad person. And all of a sudden, signs, wonders, and miracles disappeared and they were replaced with three things. Tradition, ceremony, and ritual. And for almost 1,500 wow. years, wow. this is the way the church proclaimed the gospel to the human race. Wow. That is why today, even in America, with all that we have for the gospel, most people still think God's banked off with them and going to get them. When you hear somebody is going through a tragedy, sometimes you'll hear them say, I don't know why God did this to me. This is the, the deception that was preached for 1,500 years. Tear and it down, that brother. Time, the church had to figure out how to get money because when you don't have it in the morning, you've got to figure out how to manipulate. 
You should write that down. The anointing <laughs> removes the manipulation that people have to use when they have no anointing. That's right. Whoa, I like it. I like and it. And so also they do, all of a sudden they were no longer worried about talking about down. the mantle of anointing. So they built big hats and robes and rings and they wore all these fancy clothes that they're still wearing today. Yeah. So when you get rid of the real cloak of glory and anointing, you've got to come up with something. And so they weren't building the kingdom of God, so they built edifice, churches, cathedrals. Yeah. And they built that by lying to your great ancestors and mine. Come on. They would tell you, if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to give me some cash. And by the way, your grandma got stuck in purgatory and it cost her $5,000 for us to cough her out. <laughs> and that's what they told the people. That's right. For wow. hundreds of years. Territory. And the little people of Europe who were illiterate and there were no Bibles because there was no printing press. They would go to church in 1100, 1200, 1300, 1400. There were no nice things that you have tonight or cameras to picture or capture what was happening because there was nothing to capture at all during that time. Because most of the priests should have been fired and they should have got somebody else because they told stupid stories like we have today called motivational things and nice little positive things and they did those things but back then they mainly do hostile like they would say when it thunders and lightnings outside that's God's wrath against you and you better fall down and get right and that's why when you see God speak in a cartoon or a movie or a TV show he's usually booming with thunder and lightning because they convinced people for 1500 years God always speaks angry at you wow and so ever so often there would be a few people they would say, something don't sound right. That's right. And they would say it, and then they would kill that play on Fresh Friday, yes, <laughs> play. We call them the martyrs of the church. There were more people killed by Christians than by non-Christians at one time in church history. A religious devil is a controlling murderous spirit that hides behind the camouflage of religion. They will kill you. If we have the laws today that permitted the killing of Christians today, there would still be burning and killing of Christians all over Europe and America. But since we have human rights, as we call them, we don't kill you with a gun or on fire. We just take our tongue and kill you through character assassination and do the same thing to you today. Oh, my. Same devil, Preach it. Same result. To lose your voice and your impact. Wow. And ever wow, so often wow. there would be a priest... They would actually read the Bible. Wow. A novel idea. Read the Bible. <laughs> Let me say this to you. How many people have how many Bibles at home? How many translations are on your phone? And you have people on your iPad who will read the Bible to you while you wash dishes or you do things around the house. And it's amazing how you don't even listen to them. The devil that worked in this time did not want the Bible to even be read or announced to the people. So when you would go to church in the 12 and 1300s and before, and they would read the scripture, if they would, they read it in a dead language of Latin. That's right. Which means that the language no longer spoken. So all the little peasant people would go to church and a little dumb priest dude would get up there and he would read a scripture. He would read it in Latin. So the Germans didn't know what it was, and the French didn't know what it was, and the English didn't know what it was, and the Spanish didn't know what it was. But you were just so happy to hear the language of the Bible, but you don't know what was said. Because how dare we read the language in the barbarian languages of the earth? Wow. Devil. Something so holy that you cannot give it to the common man. He kept the living word out of the heart and out of the ears of the people for hundreds of years. A man named John Whitecliffe would stand up in England. Why they didn't kill him, I don't know, but it was a miracle. And they kicked him out of the Catholic Church at that time. It was the only church. Because he provoked them and said, I think Love there's it. a problem. And they go, no, there's not. And yes, there is. And they kicked him out. And everybody great's been kicked out once. So welcome yeah. to the club. Right. Yeah. Please, yeah. get up to communicate at least once in your life for the right thing. It's a great club to be a member of. Come on. Everybody great's been kicked out of this once, and if you haven't, may God give you that experience. <laughs> he did his ministry. He had the first what we call ministry school out in the, in the woods of Great Britain. We have a picture of him somewhere. And uh, see there? There he is. There he is in his cell, uh, writing scriptures. And uh, he, had a, he had an idea. Let's do something different. Let's translate the Bible from Latin into English. Right. Ah. Yeah. That's like cussing. 
That's like murder in the minds of the people of the day. How dare you take God's holy word and put it in the barbarian language of English? Wow. But he did it. And he dies a natural death, which is a miracle. But his writings and the Bible that he translated kept going to 44 years after his death. They made a decree, dig him up. There was nothing left but bone and teeth and a little bit of hair. Dig up Mr. Whitecliffe and crush his bones into powder and burn them into ashes. And so they dug up the bones of John Whitecliffe 44 years after he was dead because people were still mad. That he had done what he'd done and that the word that he preached was still echoing wow. through the nation. And they couldn't stop us if they thought that they could destroy the remains of this great man. They could stop the progression of his ministry. And they burned his bones and crushed them up into ashes. <laughs> threw him in a river that went into the ocean and went around the world. <laughs> what they tried to do the so to make a quick story and again I'm highlighting very quickly here tonight for your benefit let me ask him why this question would anybody care you were alive 44 years after you're dead would anybody care four months after you're dead that you were alive if you don't live in a way that after you're dead your legacy still blesses and provokes that you did not live right while you were here. Come on, brother. Oh, wow. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Because I've seen great men before they were even dead, their books disappeared from the Christian bookstores by Damn six months it. after their death. 44 years after Whitecliffe's death, he was still provoking powers and principalities and ignorant little priesty dudes. And they said, burn him up and destroy what's left. And tonight in 2016, we're still talking about the guy that went first and they couldn't kill. Amen. I hope that he will live and build a ministry that 44 years after you're dead, somebody like me will talk about what you said and what you did and how you overcame the obstacles of life and overcame the challenges of the principality you face. I hope that you will live that way. If you don't, then you need to train to get saved yeah. again. Yeah. Most salvation today is Western and not divine. It is not provoke an attitude of conquering and taking over. Most of the attitude today is survival and bless me. And that's why America is suffering because the attitude of your faith stinketh. Good preaching, Brother Roberts. Amen. I could talk to you about a few more John Huss on his way to be burned alive for preaching what we'd call salvational truths. He was another one in Czechoslovakia that stood up and said, I think there's a problem when they burned him alive. Wow. As he was tied to the post and set on fire, they recorded that he would sing the songs of the Psalms wow. and prayed. But it was recorded that on his way to the stake to be burned alive, he prophesied that a hundred years from his death, there would come a man you would not be able to kill. Wow. A young man in Germany was caught in a thunderstorm one day. He was a law student. His daddy wanted him to be a lawyer. Because there was no Obamacare, you had to have a rich child to take care of you if you got old. <laughs> so that's why they had so many, because there was no iPhones or birth control. So they had babies, and they hoped that some of their children would live to adulthood, and one or two would actually live to some type of financial increase, enough that when they're old, they could be taken care of. And so Martin Luther's father, Hans Luther, wanted his son Martin to be a lawyer. But Martin Luther had been told, when it's thunder and lightning outside, that's God's anger at you. You better get right. Somewhere on that day, he was walking home and got called in a thunderstorm. And a lightning bolt hit the ground not far from where he was at. And knocked him to the ground as he would tell the story through his writings. He did not call out to Jesus because you can't talk to Jesus. He didn't even talk to Mother Mary. She was busy too. So he called out to St. Anne, which was the grandmother of Mary. So grandma had to run to Mary, and Mary had to run to Jesus, and Jesus had to run to the Father and say, Martin Luther said he'll be a preacher. <laughs> it's very sad that they didn't tell you to talk to Christ directly, and the Father through Christ had to go talk to all the saints. So Martin Luther, when he hit the ground, didn't cry out to God. He cried out to St. Anne, oh, St. Anne, help me. Since he was a man of his word, he made a determination that day because he thought God was saying, preach or die. So he said, I'll preach it. I don't want to die. He would join the monastery. That would be the 1500s thing of a Bible school. He would go to Bible school, to monastery. And he was a very faithful student, but he was a very stressful student. In the beginning of his life in the monastery, he would find a writing in one of his journal entries. It's a shocking statement that a man named Martin Luther would state. 
I hate God. How can the man named Martin Luther write in his journal when he was in monastery training, I hate God. Why would a man hate God? He thought God was unjust and cruel because he made no path by which a man could become righteous. And you had to work and try and work and try. So in those days, they believed confessional in a little booth you had to do. So he would go to the confessional booth and his spiritual father would sit on the other side of the confession. And one day, his confession was over eight hours long. Wow. wow. And finally, his priest that was over him told him, just confess the big stuff. <laughs> because he got hungry and had to go to the bathroom and was tired of sitting in the booth with Martin Luther confessing everything he thought he did that he did do that he might do in the future. Wow. He would beat himself to take on the, wow. the ropes of Christ or the wounds of Christ. Wow. Wow. He would suffer and get sick and go through fasting to the point that his body would get sick trying to find peace with God and finally the spiritual men over him said, what are we going to do with the guy named Luther? So they had a stupid idea they thought was grand but I will declare it stupid. Let's send Martin Luther from Germany to the holy city of Rome in Italy. That's where the Holy Father is and all these little idiots are. And I say that with all purpose. And I will not recant even if you are a Catholic. You can change. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's not a Catholic or a Protestant, Amen. by the way. It's oh. a for you to process. Amen. Wow. There was no BMWs or Autobahns in those days, so you had to walk from Germany to Rome. Wow. Took him months to get there. When he got to the Holy City of Rome, he had two things he wanted to do when he got to Rome. He wanted to do what the, the, the monastery had asked him to do to settle some questions, and they were hoping that while he was there, that he'd find peace with God and quit beating himself and confessing so much and so forth. But another thing in Martin Luther's heart, he wanted his grandpa out of purgatory because grandpa got stuck. When he died, he didn't quite go to hell or go to heaven. He got stuck in between. He wanted grandpa to get out and go on to the other side, to heaven. And he was hoping that while he was there, he'd find a way to pop grandpa out of purgatory and get him on into heaven. And in these days, they would come to town and they would talk about purgatory. He could give them $500 or $1,000 so they could build the Vatican and the other cathedrals they were building that time. They would pop grandpa or your grandma or your sister that died a little early out of purgatory for $500 or $1,000. And then the next thing they would do in those days, they would bring relics of the church, bones of the saints and the apostles, splinters and pieces of the cross that Christ died on, and the nails that nailed him to the cross. At one time, I counted 46 nails that were roaming around Europe. I don't think Christ had 46 nails that nailed him to the cross. I'll say 10 are being very... Luxurious with my number. They'd have Peter's finger here, John's toe over there. They'd have the hair of this and this over there. And most of them were just some dead person they found some bones and called them holy. That's what they did. The weirdest relic I found, and this explained the whole thing to you, was they would carry around in a special type of pot. Milk from the Virgin Mary's breast that Christ was drinking. <laughs> when I read that one, I thought that explains the whole relic, the weird thing, all together. Damn. Somehow they created some milky-like stuff and they called the milk from Sister Mary's breast that, that Christ had drank when he was a baby. And they would pay to see the milk from Brother Sister Mary's breast. <laughs> That's what was going to say. Why didn't the people wake up and why didn't they change? They had no Bible. They had no true preacher. They had no one there to tell them that inside of them they felt something was wrong. But there was nothing to stand on. There was not a righteous preacher. There was not a Bible to read. They were victims wow. of ignorance and wow. darkness. And the leaders of the day took advantage yeah. of the common goodwill of the people. <laughs> Martin Luther got there and he conned the 26 steps that supposedly Christ was on when he went to send the four pot and on each step he was on his knees and would say a prayer. He would get to the top of the staircase you can still see today. In Rome, I've been there myself. And a little thought flew through his head. The just shall live by faith. Amen. He went in, ran around, and popped out. It didn't stay long. The first time a phrase that would change the world wow. came into a young German's mind. Come on. As he looked at all the hundreds of people doing the same thing he had just done. 
climbing the staircase right. to find some special blessing. He would go back home from, from Rome to Germany and be worse off than he was before. They eventually sent him to a spiritual capital that would become called Wittenberg, Germany, where he'd be a pastor of a little church and a professor in the college that is there today. While he was there, he did something radical. He actually read the Bible. I'll say it again for you in the back. <laughs> While he was there, he did something radical. He actually read the Bible that was there. <laughs> Most of the Bible at this time was written by hand because there would be men and women that would spend their life, mainly men, their whole life just writing by hand. The book of St. Mark was their mission in life. That's how the Bibles were translated or, or printed, I'll say it that way, or duplicated, whatever word you'd like to use. The printing press had not been quite created yet. It was being thought about. Why did it take man so long to understand movable type? Because when religion controls society, wow. there is not a progression. There is a degression or a stalemate or advancement. Wow. When revival comes and blesses a city or a nation, progression of all kind takes off. That's why America has roads without holes in it. That's why America has hot water when you turn it on and light switch the power when you flip it on. That's why it works in our country. You go to other countries and your miracle that night is that water came out of the spit when you got back to your hotel room. And the light actually came on before you went to bed and had to get dressed for bed in the dark. Yeah. Because demons and stupid people run those countries. Corrupt minds with corrupt ways. Wow. that abuse the common man wow. of their lands. Right. True. He discovered <clears throat> something. Ninety-five things he thought the church should talk about and change. So he wrote them out on what we call the 95 Thesis. Yeah. And on Halloween day, Halloween, we'll talk about that in a minute, October 31st, the day of ghosts, goblins, vampires, and werewolves, Demons, in other words, have a free day to roam when we all dress up and get candy that kills us later. <laughs> On that day that we call Halloween was the day that the man named Martin Luther, with a revelation of the just live by faith and begin to say there needs to be a reform, a reformation, walks down to the Wittenberg church door and nails his thesis to the door to announce these things should be discussed and talked about. Yeah. Not realizing... He had just not a hole in the dark sky of the heavens and the first light beam of truth had begun to come down to earth and begin to illuminate a path of freedom and relationship with a kind, loving God. He didn't know that the guys by this time had created the printing press and they printed the Bible and they had more things to print. So what was the print was, why don't we print the sermons of this controversial German monk named Martin Luther? And so they printed the thesis and other things he said. And so all of a sudden, all over Germany, in the Bible schools, they've been talking about the thesis. And in the bars and the pubs, I'm going to jump down here. In the bars and the pubs. All right. See, Germans like beer even today, Oktoberfest. Amen. The English drink hot tea. The Italians and the French drink their wine. And the Germans drink their beer. And in those days, most people could not read. And they would go to the bar, the pub, at the end of the day. And they would sit there and drink their beer. You can move that, I'm going to get on that chair. And they would get up on a chair upon the stool, the one that could read. And they'd all be drinking their beer and they'd be reading, the one that could read, Martin Luther's writings. And while these Germans were drinking their beer, hearing Martin Luther's definition of faith and the justice of faith and all that he would say, these Germans woke up and realized they'd been fooled for 1,500 years. Wow. And they didn't cry like North Carolina charismatic Christians. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm free. No, these are Germans. <laughs> when you're not doing good things, they're creating wars. Have you noticed that in history? So these are not calm people. I'm half German, so I can say that and be safe. And so they got mad when they realized, I hope I'm okay to walk out. Uh, because I like this this way, I can grab you. And uh, they got angry, and they didn't go. We're going to go have a prayer meeting. They go, where's the priest at? Right. And they wow. made a fist and punched him. 
And they kicked him. They oh. killed a few of them too, by the way. They went a little too far. <laughs> and they burnt down some of the churches and burned up some of the Catholic relics or the Catholic things in the church. They got angry because for 1,500 years yeah. they didn't like to and all their money had been taken to put a ring on the Pope and a hat on his head and a cathedral that God ever was invited to come to. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> and so now for the first time in their life the scene inside had proof <coughs> That what they knew there was something wrong. Now they knew what it was, and they began to have a revolt and a revolution. Right. They put Martin Luther on a trial. Can you believe at one time you could actually go on trial for not believing what the hierarchy said? Right. They put you on trial, like for murder or thieving or whatever, because you didn't believe the doctrines of the church of that day. Wow. And they put Martin Luther on a trial. What would you do if you were on trial? Would people in your church still come and like you? If Pastor Todd and his wife were put on trial because of their belief, would you still come back to the church and come to his conferences? I don't know. I know you say you would now because you're in a nice, comfortable room and there's no threat. Preach but back it. then there was a threat. They put him on trial. They sent the religious lawyers from Rome. The German government, and I'll say it this way, said you cannot try a German not on German soil, so they couldn't take him to Rome and kill him and the others. They came in the officials, the religious leaders, the Vatican lawyers, and the peasantry, which would be us. They were on the outside listening through the window. And they brought Martin Luther to the middle of this place where the trial was. And they laid in front of him on a table while all these intimidating demonic idiots were staring down at him like they did Paul and Peter and Jesus. <laughs> and the little dude asked him, are these your writings? He said, yes. And eventually the little guy, as they explained each one, said, now you must recant what you've written. It is false doctrine. It is wrong. And Martin Luther asked for an extra night to consider his answer. Wow. Wow. You think, why would a man that had a revelation of a half a verse. It wasn't even a whole verse. It was a little bitty verse. What could he have done if he had a whole verse? Okay. Wow. wow. He had a half a verse. <laughs> Romans 1, 17. The just shall live by faith. Right. He word. didn't get the revelation before the verse. He got a little phrase in the verse. It's a little bitty verse about that big. That's all he had. And how many do you have in you? And you're still goofy? <laughs> how many have you heard just being a part of the conference here? Wow. In this ministry and others around, in this little utopia of Christianese? Yeah. Of yeah. prophetic woo-woos? Yeah. yeah. Apostolic want-to-bees? Come on! <laughs> Who are too scared to actually leave the utopia of this area to go be? Yeah, come Called on. chicken. Oh, chicken. Not an eagle. You're a chicken. <laughs> and the feathers that show up in your camp are chicken feathers and not eagle feathers. <laughs> There's oh. a thought for you to have at dinner tonight. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Good preaching, Brother Roberts. Hey. Yeah. Good preaching, Brother. Good preaching, isn't it? Good preaching, Brother. So Martin Luther goes to his little room where the tribe was being held. To pray to find out because on his shoulders, what if he was wrong? And would he lead his countrymen and the fellow people of faith that was following him to error into hell? He went to his room and prayed. He said, I fought with the Lucifer that night. Whether it was him or his cousin, I don't know, but he said Lucifer. So I'll take him at his word. He fought more with the night in prayer. Somewhere in the early hours of the morning, he found victory over that spirit of intimidation and decided what he was going to say. So the next day he came and they brought him to the same place with the same people with the same questions. That day he had an answer. And he said to them in a paraphrase quote, Unless you can prove to me by Scripture and Scripture alone, not by popes or cardinals or bishops who lie, counterdict, and do things contrary to even their own words. 
Unless you can prove to me by Scripture, scripture. that I am wrong, I will not recant. Here is where I stand. And that day, for the first time in 1500 years of Christian history, a little German monk with a bad haircut busted the heavens open and the first light of what we now enjoy as an open heaven came into the earth in the 1500s. The press and the people of that day that were in hierarchy could not kill him like Paul because the common man cheered him and loved him and they couldn't kill Martin Luther. So Martin Luther got out of town and was on a wagon and they were taking him back to Wittenberg and in the middle of the, of the, of the forest there came knights like you would see knights would wear with their armor to the wagon. And they asked, which one is Luther? And he answered in his eye. And they put a bag or a sack over his head wow. and took him away. The people that were with Martin Luther thought they're going to kill Brother Martin. They didn't know that the German governor had sent his private military wow. to save the life of the reformer named Martin Luther. Wow. Wow. They took him to a castle. He grew out his hair and changed his name to George. I don't know why he picked George, but he went from Martin to George. That's funny. And a man with that kind of spirit and that kind of mind, because Martin Luther was a mental genius as well as a spiritual man of faith of that time. That's a good word. See, mind and heart can work together if you know how to make your body submit to the great spirit of God. Most charismatics have not learned to govern themselves they just learn how to tap with their spirit but not govern their flesh and their soul. And that's why you're weird and not a respectable person in society. <laughs> when you can combine all of that come on, come to knock at your door for the counsel of God and man come on. from all parts of society. Come on, come on. Come on. No weird. He said, I'm bored. We have more Luther pictures somewhere. He said, I have to do something besides feed the chickens. There he is. Can you go back one? There he is. He's a beast. He said, I gotta do something in this castle. So he had an idea like John Whitecliffe did. He said, let's translate the Bible into German. Because wow. there was the German language of the north and the German language of the south. <coughs> and so he got all the scriptures and all the Latin and all the stuff and all of his books, and he translated the New Testament into German and created the language that they use today in many ways. For the first time in German history, there was a book that they all cherished called the Bible that they could read for themselves. The Bible had come to the common German man. Wow. From there, we have the Reformation that took off. A man that turned the world upside down by a half a verse. Wow, uh, half a how verse. How many do you know and you haven't done nothing yet? Just a thought. Good word. He would write a hymn that most of you don't know today. Martin Luther would write in his journal after he came into the power of his faith and his anointing. He said, I enjoy fighting demons, doctrines, and popes. I'm God's battle axe. Other men like to live in the sound of pleasantries. I like the conflict of faith and the fight of Come the on. dark side. Right. And in the middle of that, yeah. they write a hymn called The Mighty Fortress. Oh, yeah. A mighty fortress is our God. Yeah. A bulwark yes. that never fails. Yes. But most of you don't know that song you because know. it didn't come from oh, that song. <laughs> That's why you don't know it. You said, you know, you know, you know that Because it didn't come from that song. <laughs> there are a few. And add into the record. Watch on FreshFireUSA.com. The entire media replay. There were 13 Fresh Fire nuns. USA. Just go with me, it's only 9 for you. Oh, oh, yes. 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 Oh, oh. There were 13 nuns in a convent that was called a lady's prison of faith. And so back then, you, you couldn't get out of these places without a lot of work. You had to work to get in, and you couldn't get out like you do today. It was a whole different world. It's hard for us to comprehend that, but it's the truth. There was 13, and someone may say that there was nine little nuns left that wanted out. 
because one of Martin Luther's little reformational tracks had got in there. They'd heard about the revival, as we'd call it, and they wanted to leave the convent and join the Reformation. So one of the nuns' dad was the one that brought supplies to the convent, and she told her daddy, I, 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 and about nine of us, eight of us, nine counting her, we want out! Can you help us get out? And he thought real hard. He thought, I have an idea. I'll bring nine barrels of supply next month. And I'll empty one barrel and pop one of you in and nail you in. So he had nine nuns in the barrels when he left. <laughs> <laughs> and took them out yes. into the German forest far enough that he popped them out. <laughs> and they walked from the German forest from where they were, which took weeks, to Wittenberg, Germany. Find a man named Martin Luther. Wow. They come walking in with not much, but just we're right here. <laughs> they found a man when they walked through into Wittenberg. Said, "Where's Martin Luther?" They didn't know they were they were talking to him. Said, "Why?" Well, he got out of the convent, and we're here to help. Martin Luther took him in. He had a problem. His was a monastery. What do you do with a monastery? Now you've got nine nuns. <laughs> it's not the way you house the folks. <laughs> and so he took them in. And he thought, what am I going to do with nine nuns? Nine nuns. So he did something else radical. Come on. Let's get them married to some of my preacher monks. <laughs> yeah. And so he broke the... FreshfireUSA.com. Oh, yes. Get the replay. See you later. And Thanks. have babies. <laughs>